Okay, welcome back. T uh, today in this short video lecture, I would like to introduce you to Virginia Woolf's Mark on the Wall. And the reason I chose it is because it's short and accessible, and it's interesting. And it opens up another aspect of modernism that we were uh, exploring in The Second Coming. But here, it's more focused on the self, the interior, rather than the big themes of history and um, religion and so forth. Here you have uh, a stream of consciousness, that we've stream of consciousness writing, that is extremely important in this period. In this period, you had the uh, it's contemporary with other experiments in modernism, including uh, futurism in Italy, uh, cubism, and Dadaism in in France and uh, around different parts of Europe, and um, surrealism would come a bit a bit later. But it's Dadaism is this playful, energetic, political. Um, uh, re what do you call it? Um, response to World War One primarily, and the absurdity of war. There's a lot of fantastic French anti-war poetry that came after that. And here in Virginia Woolf, who was part of the Bloomsbury circle or Bloomsbury coterie or group, it's a it's a group of uh, middle upper class, extremely well educated uh, people in London uh, from different fields. Um, I, 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 some were uh, in, into um, more more um, sociology or psychology or, or, or business, economics, some into literature, philosophy and these kind of things, uh, painting. And the the group is known for its uh, se freedom of thought, including uh, sexual exploratory sort of uh, thought and and uh, interaction. So there's a prominence of uh, bisexuality in this that it precedes the liberation, the gay liberation movement, and the sexual revolution in the 60s and 70s. Okay, so here, uh, that sort of identity formation was less important than just the doing whatever you wanted to do, and so it could best be described as a pansexuality, rather than a focusing on a, a binary uh, sexuality. You're e either straight or gay, this sort of thing. Okay, so that's interesting about them, and you can read about that, and that led to her writing this long. Uh, sort of proto science fiction fantasy trans gender trans uh, sexual orientation a novel called Orlando about 11 years after she first published this this is her first published story by the mark on the wall first published in ni uh, 1917 and in any case um, this exemplifies a uh, a, f a, f a freeing of thought, not just a freedom of thought, but a, a, f a freeing of thought. Excuse me. That um, that going back to the Dadaism that uh, pre that uh, dovetails with goes along with what came after Dada, which is similar to Dada, this sort of f free wordplay, uh, flagrant. Um, flaunting of normal diction, word use, riffing on words and punning and so forth, openly political in Dada. In Surrealism you have a variation, an extension of this that's inspired by Sigmund Freud. Now, Sigmund Freud uh, postulated many things, but on, among the various for 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 us interested in poetry and fiction writing and literature, this idea that when we write, 
our poetic authority comes not from our conscious thought, like like a mathematician. We imagine a mathematician working on a problem, problem solution, problem solution. Compare different solutions, analyze. No, uh, for writing, there needs to be some sort of fiction of a a subject construct, an authority active. And so here, with Freud, we have, and this is uh, proto. Uh, surrealists. Surrealists would develop this in a way, but surrealists were extremely male-centered, uh, gendered male, in a way that really, well, so is Freud for that matter, but uh, that really um, inhibits what we can understand from this engagement with the fictions of an uh, unconscious authority. And I don't want to go into Freud uh, there's a there's a, a lot that can be said about Freud, but for our purposes, just think of you have a conscious conscious level of thought where everything is clear, everything is formulated in logical, coherent subject verb object in English, uh, uh, or 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 um, Chinese or Japanese or whatever language you're you're using, very clear, coherent, polished, nice. Writing like when you're writing your essays, you have to write like that. You you cannot let your unconscious take over. <laughs> so you have conscious clarity, and then you have your sort of subconscious, which are uh, slips. Sl you slip. You you have uh, slips where, say, you have sort of uh, uh, a crush on someone, but you're hiding it. Your conscious is controlled by your. Um, what does Freud call it? Uh, he has many different sort of systems. It's not like one system. He has many different ways of approaching different situations. But um, So you, you have the conscious, and then sometimes he'll talk about a, a superego. So religious discourse becomes, informs us, of, uh, in a, as a, functions as a superego, a meta-discourse that tells us how to act. right? And then... Uh, the uh, consciousness is just our embodiment of our ego. But when we talk, we of course use language, which is tapped into a public consciousness of possibility. So it's sort of between the superego, the, the possibilities of understanding and epistem epistemology, what can be known. And then... Uh, the uh, the the our own uh, ego, in in our ego we have our it can be divided into our super ego, which is tied into this public religious discourse what we're taught we're supposed to do, and then we have our the present, and how we situate ourselves in a field at a given moment, and of uh, relate to others. And then we have a so, so subconscious where we're slipping, where our unconscious, uh, called unconscious desires, uh, slip into our waking conscious life. So waking and sleeping, waking is consciousness, sleeping is unconsciousness. When we dream, we enter the, the world of our, our dream unconsciousness. Uh, if you use uh, terrestrial topographical metaphors. When we're awake, we're on land. When we're asleep, we slip into the ocean. <laughs> where it's watery, watery. So water becomes a symbol, especially in surrealism, and melted things like in the, the Dali paintings. You can find a lot of melted clocks and so forth um, for the unconscious. So the unconscious desires are tied to the libido. So you have the superego, on the one hand, religious doctrine, telling us what our libido, I mean, if you simplify it, you have all these uh, opposing forces. And, and I'm paraphrasing because I'm influenced by later uh, post-Freudian uh, writers like Lacan and Zizek and Badiou. So my understanding is, is, is uh, more complicated. And, and Hegel gets worked in there too later by, by uh, these. Um, in any case, what's important to realize is that Virginia Woolf's stream of consciousness in its gendered aspects, which are prominent, can be made prominent, um, suggest a 
sort of a politicization of feminine consciousness or w women's consciousness in a way that takes this Freudian unconscious and sort of activates a powerful um, feminine vision and voice and way of thinking that uh, supports non-conforming, that is, non-male controlled discourses. Um, and the, the whole story, as you know from reading it, is basically a meditation on a snail, right? I mean, the whole mark on the wall, it ends up being a snail. And so this uh, becomes a, a, a pivot for many n different discourses, and that becomes the starting point for a grand irony. Whenever you have something that can be seen from more than one perspective, as it is, it's a mark on the wall. No, it's a, it's a snail, not just a mark. It has its own little world, just like a person in a room, right? And and so this uh, becomes a, uh, a um, ironic. Yeah, we the reader see the irony of a person struggling with a mark on the wall, and the author presenting this person struggling. Remember the, the persona. There's the author, and then there's the narrator. The narrator is the persona that the author creates that allows us to see the irony of someone trying to understand a mark on the wall that's actually a snail. Okay? Okay, so let's uh, go through this. Uh, the, uh, the mark on the wall, let's, let's begin at the beginning, though we could begin at the end. Just mention the end, the snail. Um, so, the way this is written, it begins by focusing on the mark and ends by this, the realization it's a snail and some comments on which we may call today uh, post-human concern for other forms of life, non-human forms of life, the animal, the wood even, and identifying with that, to let the mind wander. And it, and it uh, most of it though is a free, free association. Just a, a tumbling of thoughts. Now, wh what do we make of this? So, it basically, you can see this as not literature in the sense of uh, something that is meant to educate us in some way, but literature that is to entertain. It's not to sell, though it is to sell. Her husband at the time, her started a a, a publishing house, a, a, a press, to sell these books, but this entertaining value is also a part of a more serious use of language. This press, by the way, also published one of the most important collections of poetry of the 20th century, the early 20th century anyhow, is T.S. Eliot's poems, which include Proof Rock, which we're going to talk about in the next video. In any case, um, so this, you could see this as this mark on the wall, this first short story of Virginia Woolf's as demonstrating this entertaining pleasure of a mind just daydreaming. It's not about social criticism, it's not anti-war, yet it includes a consciousness of uh, social consciousness, uh, a, just, uh, a consciousness of concern for making the world better, a critical consciousness, you could say, um, that, that shows an, a caring, expansive mind, as well as a uh, somewhat inward turning, which we associate with, uh, f f what do you call it, um, free, uh, free, associa free association and stream of consciousness. Okay? Or it's also called sometimes automatic writing this kind of writing. And another famous woman uh, who, who wrote this way is, um, oh God, what's her name? Tender Buttons by, um, 
Gertrude Stein. So Tender Buttons by Gertrude Stein came out just a few years before this, in 1914. And this uh, is very um, playful, no, extremely playful. It's so important in the history of poetry, Tender Buttons, uh, that it uh, influenced the what's called the, the language poetry movement, all in caps with hyphens between the in the word language, language poetry movement of the 19, mostly 1980s, 90s, late 70s, in a, a journal called Sulphur. Okay. Um, now, um, so she, it begins with, perhaps it was the middle of January in the present year that I first looked up and saw the mark on the wall. So this sense of time tricks us, really, because uh, it, it, it implies that this mark has been there a long time. Uh, it just suggests it. We don't know what month it is right now, uh, January, but um, the sense of trying to remember suggests that it's something that's been there a long time. And we know that snails move, and they move quite quickly, if you pay attention to the snails. And... Um, any, in any case, so there's this play here, this the muse, this muse of the play between consciousness and unconsciousness, this constant slipping, this stream of consciousness that allows this this slipping uh, suggests a play between the the inner, the inner, what do you call it? The popular term is the the uh, mind's eye, or imaginations, and the the outer, the manifest perceptions of ostensible phenomena that are out there in the exterior world. So you have the interior and the exterior, the mind and the exterior matter. And the whole idea of separating these is problematic, of course, but that's uh, something to be uh, always mediated. So we have all these words that we use to talk about this. It's not easy. There are so many pitfalls in trying to, to talk about. There's so many different philosophical concepts and frames and modes of situating that it gets complicated very quickly. But in literature, we don't have to fo focus on that at, at, at the undergraduate level at, uh, in such detail. Um, but we, um, we, 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 we can uh, analyze the particular uh, words used. So it begins with this suggestion that it's been there a long time, and if you go down about uh, five lines, and this is page uh, 2145. Um, I looked up and saw the mark on the wall for the first time. I, I looked up through the smoke of my cigarette and my eye lodged for a moment upon the burning coals and that old fancy of the crim crimson flag flapping from the castle tower came into my mind. So there's this free association. okay? And I thought of the cavalcade of the Red Knights riding up the side of the Black Rock. So this one after another, just one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And what happens? Rather to my relief, the sight of the mark, writing up the sight. Uh, rather to my relief, the sight of the mark interrupted the fancy, the the fantasy, for it is an old fancy, an automatic fancy, uh, made as a child perhaps. The mark was a small round mark, black upon white wall, about six or seven inches above the mantelpiece. So to my relief, the sight of the mark. That phrase suggests that this mark became sort of the eye of the storm. Her thoughts were racing, her, her mind was racing, it was, she was in a brain, brainstorming of the possibilities of the mark of, and, and different things around the, the mantle. But also that became the, the still point that helped calm her, so to speak. Okay? Um, so how rarely our thoughts swarm upon a new object. So then she becomes aware of, uh, declares awareness of what I just was talking about, how a new object uh, leads to brainstorming but becomes the center of that brainstorming. And there's a famous uh, French philosopher, um, Michel Foucault, uh, F-O-U-C-A-U-L-T, and uh, he had this book called, he had many interesting books, Order of Things, Archaeology of Knowledge, and in the I think it's the first chapter of the Archaeology of Knowledge. He defines a, 
a discourse in relation to an object as something that takes an object and makes it the focus of its discourse. And then the discourse becomes the discourse on the object becomes more important than the object itself. It becomes has a life of its own. And so this is what this story sort of illustrates is how various discourses sort of hover and tether, engage this object of the snail and produce many different uh, facets, different discourses. Each discourse, a uh, different facet of the, the writer's engagement with the object, the snail. Okay? Um, now, that's about all I want to say, but before we end, I want to uh, talk about a few important passages in it to uh, make clear. So if you go to page uh, 2146, right in the second full paragraph, and yet that mark in the wall is not a hole at all. So she's, you know, she's been thinking about what it is and it may even be caused by some round black substance, such as a small rose leaf, left over from the summer. And I, not being a very vigilant housekeeper, look at the dust on the mantelpiece, for example, the dust which, so they say, buried Troy, three times over, only fragments of pots, utterly refusing annihilation, as one can believe. So this the sense of free association, you know, imagining Troy reading too much uh, the, the, the classic uh, literature, and then, um, um, but what is this? Only fragments of pots are utterly refusing. Them. If it's something related to a vigilant housekeeper, then it's suggesting uh, women's labor. Something just that's not coincidental. So that's a sort of um, uh, working in some larger picture that includes women, whereas a lot of times the focus on Troy would not be on the woman so much as the warriors, the men, okay? And then, if you go to the next paragraph, right in the, about four lines down, I want to sink deeper and deeper away from the surface, surface with its hard, separate facts. To steady myself, let me catch hold of the first idea that passes. Shakespeare, well, he will do as well as another. A man who sat himself solidly in an armchair and looked into the fire so... A shower of ideas fell perpetually from some very high heaven down through his mind. He leant his forehead on his hand. And people, looking in through the open door, for this scene is supposed to take place on a summer's evening. But how dull this is, this historical fiction. It doesn't interest me at all. I wish I could hit upon a pleasant track of thought, a track indirectly reflecting credit upon myself. For those that are the pleasantest thought, pleasant, the pleasantest thoughts, and very frequent even in the minds of modest mouse-colored people who believe genuinely that they dislike to hear their own praises. They are not thoughts directly praising oneself. That is the beauty of them. And they are thoughts like this. And then he, he goes on. It, um, so Vir Virginia Woolf Wor Wor was a very um, uh, sp spirited, active, creative mind, but also a very a little bit uptight, constantly trying to hone down her prose into perfect, you know, uh, glittering, crystalline uh, prose that balances ambiguity of meaning, richness of ev evocative uh, reverberations and, and uh, clarity at the same time. But here, what she's talking about, I want to sink deeper, da, 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 is she wants to recover something authentic, some sort of authenticity in some object that is perfectly uh, evocative of a world of meaning, and yet is just it just is, too, in some way. Yeah. So in other words, she wants an object that has this fulcrum by which... M many different meanings are possible and very entertaining but also that it is something to hang your hat on something to, to give some form of uh, stability, security maybe even or um, 
So this this is a question, an epistemological question of knowledge. How to know? Uh, how to link the self to nature? The the eye to the object? This mark on the wall? And what does it all mean? And when she goes, when she mentions Troy above there, you can also think of the um, Keats. Remember in the in the, the the first half of the semester, the the Keats poem. How did the Keats relate to the scene on the Grecian urn? Okay, so here we have a, a similar situating of the self and the questioning the meaning of life, the meaning of art, the meaning of the the scene then the scene now, and how are different um, people and objects categorized or placed into um, uh, r recognizable um, uh, cate categories and boxes and uh, hierarchical relations and so forth by which uh, society uh, seems to uh, order uh, the dis distribution of labor, such as mentioning women doing the housework there, this kind of thing, okay? And so there's a critical consciousness engaged here, and a d disruption of norms and a rethinking of the possibilities of life. Let's go on to the next page, 2147. Here, explores, here she explores the fragility of the self, the image of the self itself. She says, uh, uh, or is it uh, so very curious? After all, it is a matter of great importance. Suppose the looking glass smashes, the image disappears, and the romantic figure with the green of forest depths all about it there is, n is there no longer, but only that shell of a person which is seen by other people. What an airless, shallow, bald, prominent world it becomes, a world not to be lived in. So what if everything were just something seen by others, uh, surface images, there's nothing, in, nothing, no interiority, no self. As we face each other in omnibuses and underground railways, we are uh, looking into the mirror. It accounts for the vagueness, the gleam of glassiness in our eyes, and the novelist in the future will realize more and more the importance of these reflections. For, of course, there is not one reflection, but an almost infinite number. Those are the depths they will explore, those the phantoms they will pursue, leaving the description of reality more and more out of their stories, taking a knowledge of it for granted, as the Greeks did in Shakespeare, perhaps. But these generalizations are very worthless. The military sound of the word is enough. It recalls leading articles, cabinet ministers, a whole class of things indeed, which, as a child, one thought the thing itself, the standing thing, the standard thing, the real thing, from which one could not depart, save at the risk of nameless damnation. Generalizations bring back somehow Sunday in London, Sunday afternoon walk, Sunday luncheons, and all, and also ways of speaking of the dead, clothes, and habits. Like the habit of sitting all together in one room until a certain hour, although nobody liked it. There was a rule for everything, and the rule for tablecloths at the particular period that they should be made of tapestry, little yellow compartments marked upon them and so forth and so on. So it's all about how everything is supposed to be such and such. Everything has a place. And then she goes down and mentions Whitaker's Table of president Precedence. See, this is the hierarchy of positions, of uh, the social hierarchy of titles, the lords and duchesses, of sirs, who is to have more importance than the other, who has more land than the other and should be respected more than the other. If there's a dispute, who should prevail? This is all being challenged and she questions all of it and mocks it. And so this goes back to the French Revolution, the pamphlet wars that we read at the beginning towards the beginning of the semester, and how in England there's this debate that still exists because the monarchy still exists. The queen is still the queen. And you still have people like uh, Sir Paul McCartney, Sir, Sir Sean Connery. I mean whether these titles are you're born with or bestowed for your great acts, you know. And in America, for instance, you have a parallel thing. You have the Medal of Honor that will be given uh, for your action, but sometimes it's not very um, sincere. Sometimes it's uh, given to people just because they're 
politically aligned without any relation to the the concept of for instance medal of freedom you know this kind of thing anyway um so th this this pun on general in generalizations the v the mi i want to make sure you caught that she says the military sound of the word is not the general in generalization uh is the military sound of the word she's talking about okay so uh she's attacking how words become just known by their generalizations their their titles and and for a uh, some sort of knowledge that transcends their physicality and that the infinite number of perspectives and this is again this is related to modernism after modernization that we talked about in the video on um uh the second coming the yet Ye second coming this is exactly this sort of uh, rel relatively relativity this breaking up of systems uh, due to the expansion of uh, the Enlightenment to the point where matter itself becomes displacing of the unity of space-time itself relatively and matter itself becomes known to be primarily uh, understand, understandable, comprehensible as waves and, and uh, dynamic relations that are not solid, ultimately nothing solid there. Um, okay. And then, if you go to the bottom of page 2148, she talks about nature. Okay. Um, she talks, she mentions the Whitaker's Almanac, the table of presence that we just talked about, the, and um, text it again. But then she has this final paragraph there. Here is nature once more at her old game of self-preservation. This train of thought, she perceives, is threatening mere waste of energy, even some collision with reality. For who will ever be able to lift a finger against Whitaker's table of precedency? Pre precedency. So this idea is that it's a, there's, a, there's a, a stream of consciousness here, right? But this She's not talking about stream of consciousness. She's talking about um, this... Uh, train of thought. This train of thought is this train of logical thought, this table of pregnancy, who should precede who. And then she gives examples. The Archbishop of Canterbury is followed by the Lord High Chancellor. The Lord High Chancellor is followed by the Archbishop of York. Everybody follows somebody, <laughs> such as the philosophy of Whitaker. And the great thing is to know who follows whom. And so she, this is parallel to the earlier comments about everything having its place. When you set the table, you have to have your knife and fork in the proper manner. There must be a tablecloth that has a design that includes a certain level of embroidery acceptable to the common people, at least. Okay, this sort of uh, s snobbish idea that, that there's a proper way of doing everything. You know. You know what I mean. And I, I love to imitate the British. They are really mad at me, though, sometimes. Uh, I had a really good friend from Manchester, and uh, and uh, uh, this is a long time ago, and I would I would imitate <laughs> his Manchester accent, which is not too far away from where the Beatles grew up, you know, in Liverpool. Quite charming lads they are, and um, and then he would imitate my American accent, how he heard it in his head. It it was hilarious. Oh, I'm getting sidetracked here. But he, his American, his imitation of American accent went something like this. Well, you Americans like to talk like this for a really long time. Really, I could have potatoes in your mouth or something. So I, was, I thought that was just darling, just precious, just absolutely stunning. Okay, and there's actually a vocabulary between the two languages that are quite different. Um, so, Whitaker knows... And and uh, let that so nature counsels comfort you instead of enraging you. And if you can't be comforted, if you must shatter this hour of peace, think of the mark on the wall. So here, what's interesting here is this this discrepancy between language that is exemplified 
by this table of precedence, which is the ultimate placement of things within an altar of generalization. So this is not Rousseau's encyclopedia, where you're, you're trying to gather knowledge on everything. I'd be interested to know what, what uh, Virginia Woolf would have thought of that, if she would have talked about that. She's keeping it very within, very much within the world of, of uh, English references, Shakespeare and, and so forth, which itself is fascinating in an age of um, international um, commerce and, 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 uh, and uh, influence and translation and so forth. She, she herself published in her press the translations of Freud, right? Translated from German. Okay, so then let's go to the last part here. Um, was that clear? So the, the point was that there's a gap between the generalizations and the language used and nature itself, so to speak. Uh, and so that nature becomes um, the, uh, have double meaning in the way she's, she seems to use it in two ways. So um, that what is natural is to follow the rules that are simple social conventions. Um, but then there's also nature, like in the sense of the wood she talks about. She goes now and talks about the wood. Her counter-argument is based on wood. And then the example of the snail itself, the realization that it's a snail. So notice, this is what we call the post-human. This idea that the human may be displaced the, pr the privileged point of view of the human may be displaced by the non-human, whether it's animate, like a whale, very intelligent mammal, or wood, not thought to have any brain, but interesting in how it grows and so forth, the tree. So, um, the, the, the next page, the last page, 2149, Indeed, now that I have fixed my eyes upon it, I feel that I have grasped a plank in the sea. I feel a, I feel a satisfying sense of reality which at once turns the two archbishops and the Lord High Chancellor to the shadows of shades. Here is something definite, something real. Thus waking from a midnight dream of horror, one hastily turns on the light, so she's going from these different scenes, these grand scenes of situating herself within the these uh, books, uh, the Almanac, the Whitaker's Almanac, the Table of Presidents, and then uh, nat Nature's Game. This mark on the inter introduces the mark on the wall, and she says that is one wants to be sure of wood. Wood is the pleasant thing to think about like the wood, like where the mark on the wall is, w on the wood on the wall. It comes from a tree, and trees grow, and we don't know how they grow. For years and years they grow without paying any attention to us in meadows, in forests. So this becomes the object itself talking. This is a perfect example, absolutely perfect example, even though we say, well, post-humanism wasn't invented yet. Ha <laughs> ha, doesn't matter. We still have this manifestation of something we now can name in earlier literature, which is, the point of view of wood. Okay? So the non-human point of view is introduced here. And it's not simply a uh, personification of a uh, frog in Aesop's fables. Is there, a, there must be a frog. In, you know, going back uh, centuries ago. Or Grimm's fairy tales or Mother Goose or something like that. Uh, th these are not personifications of animals. These are trying to understand what it feels like to be a tree, a piece of wood, or later maybe a rock or, or anything, a toad, or, um, uh, this kind of thing, okay? I like to think of the tree itself. First of the close, dry sensation of being wood. This is definitely post-human. Then the grinding of the storm. How a storm will blow a tree around. I used to, uh, where I grew up, there were these huge... Uh, Douglas fir trees above me, and I could see from my window. And they, would in, whenever storm or not, if the wind was blowing hard, the way they moved was so beautiful. It was like the waves of a of a sea. I'll never forget that. Okay, and um, 
let's see. And then she 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 goes in this long train of of uh, um, association and comes down to where was I? The last four lines of this long paragraph on the, this last page. What has it all been about? A tree? A river? The downs? The above reference to the South Downs, the the ancient prehistoric mounds and so forth. Wh Whittaker's Almanac? The field of asphodel? I can't remember a thing. Everything's moving, falling, slipping, vanishing. Where did we hear that before? Recall the first two lines of a second coming. The falconer cannot hear the, the falconer. The, there's a winding, widening gyre. There's a vast upheaval of matter. Someone is standing over me and saying, I'm going out to buy a newspaper. Yes. Though it's no good buying newspapers, nothing ever happens. Curse this war. God damn this war. All the same, I don't see why we should not have a snail on a wall. Ah, the mark on the wall. It was a snail. So it's a humorous closing. But notice how it ends with the sort of uh, dialogue that you sort of expect in a T.S. Eliot poem. You have this banter between people, just everyday conversation just thrown into the literary work. But here it's used to casually mention, without the author herself just saying, oh, I looked up again and I noticed, indeed, it's a snail. That would be so boring. So she has another character. She drags into the story. And this character, she goes, I'm going out to buy a newspaper, her husband or some sort of imagined thing. Yes? Well, you have a nice time, dear darling. And then adds this uh, other talk about, and uh, God damn this war and so forth. Um, that adds, a, a just in a passing way, sort of a political protest against having wars, um, elective wars especially, not wars fo foisted upon you. And then um, this kind of thing. Okay, so um, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. I think she's amazing. And if you like her, you can read her other stories, Miss Dalloway and um, uh, what's the other one? The Orlando. Okay. See you soon.